<laughs> wow, thanks. So do you understand what I mean by that? When someone reaches a moment in their lives where they are free, and yet their freedom isn't real unless they bring their sisters with them. Yeah, Rodessa true. Jones. <laughs> what we saw tonight was extraordinary. Extraordinary. And for many of us who have been in this work over the years, we've only saw and witness your soul pour out with every performance, but also the things that we haven't seen. Mm. The babies that you've buried. Mm. The money that you've had to raise to keep yes. this work going. Uh, but you know, I'd just like to say for you, I, I, I feel like we're kindred spirits because we were both mothers before we were women. Yeah. Come on. You know, Come you know. On. I mean, I had a baby at 16. I think 19. you were eight. you were 19, and I think that really speaks to this active service, you know, making making a way for other women to come through and making it a little bit easier. Because it's like, I mean, I, I'm writing about it now. I'm writing about why is it that I do what I do, and I have to go all the way back to having this child at 16. Now she's 51. You know, it's like she turns 51 now uh, tomorrow, uh, Monday. And uh, it's, it's been an incredible journey. And I know that you, you, can, you can attest to the same things, yeah. You know, first of all, it's in immensely humbling sitting on the stage with someone who creates just every day. And we have spent much of our adult life working inside of institutions with women who have been incarcerated because yes. they have illnesses, right? Yes. Because they struggle with addiction or they're sick and they will fight like hell to feed their children. Mm -hmm. Right now, in this jail, yes. down the street, yes. right in San Francisco, women are incarcerated in brick and concrete cages for relapsing. Yes. Right? Task of so I want yes. you, if you can, I want, I, I'm, we're gonna talk about the classics, okay? We're gonna do that. But I actually want you to set up for folks. I was sitting next to my sister girl and she said that girl looks too young to have had contact with the criminal justice system. She's a baby. Mm. I want you to go back to when you start doing this mm. work and give the folks in here the texture of the injustices of how we treat women who are dying to survive, not only in the city, but across the country and the world. Talk to us about your work in 850 and why theater? Why theater and, wh and why self-expression? Mm. Well, when I first started uh, at uh, 850 Bryant Street, uh, they asked me to go in and teach aerobics to incarcerated women. Uh, I said, okay, uh, whatever, you know, so. <laughs> and I went in and there were so many women there that looked like me, black and brown women who looked like me, and they were mad as hell. They were just mad as hell. And I said, well, okay, wait, 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 wait. let's talk about why you're mad. And they looked at me and they said, well, sister, you know. And I thought, I might have my own version of the story, but I want you to give it up. I want you to tell me what happened to you. And I don't want you to blame the judge or the man. I want, you to, I want you to go back and look at how you took that free fall and who was there and what happened. And they were just fascinated that I wanted them to tell me the story, to tell me what happened to them. Because nobody had ever asked them, for real. You know, they, they are punished, they're slapped around because they won't keep their butts home. They're all, quote, welfare queens. And all those things are not true, you know. There's a lot of reasons to be anesthetized in this culture. I feel like I'm glad I missed that, I missed that one. But you know, I met a woman, that was a woman that would sit and she was looking into another void. I mean, she just would, and I would say, well, we're going to the gym today because I was an aerobics teacher, right? <laughs> okay, everybody, we're gonna go to the gym, you know, this is your life, this is a rehearsal, blah, 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 blah. And she'd say, only God can judge me. And I couldn't figure out what, it, what was up. And then I found out that she had actually murdered her baby in a, in a cocaine hallucination. Yeah. Yeah. She had smothered her baby because he said, 
You know, I want you out of here. All I want is my baby out of this MF. I want you gone. And she, like Medea, said, oh yeah, watch this. And I, don't, I didn't even blame her. How dare you? He brought the dope in the house in the first place. And all of a sudden she was addicted to cocaine. And they both were in pain, I'm sure. And then the baby is smothered. And, but I heard the story and I started to talk to the jailers about it. And they were saying, mm-hmm, yeah, that's what's happened. And she walked through on the way to the showers and all the women went mad. They wanted to kill her. They wanted to tear her apart. And I said, wait a minute. What are the ways that we're murdering our children? Yeah. We're here, but not with them. Yeah, come on. And thus began this conversation about why you go to jail, what happened, looking for love in all the wrong places, dying for love. And I mean, that's a, that's a hard one to judge because we all want love, right? We all want to be held and kissed and even told, ooh, baby, you're so fine. But we know that's a cracker. <laughs> and someday my prince will come. No, he won't. <laughs> Dick and dope equals death, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and so this was my beginning with the, with the whole idea of where do I enter with women who were, because I have eight brothers. Mm -hmm. I had a brother who was at Attica when the, when the uh, uh, insurrection went down. And uh, so I knew something about black men going to prison, but I didn't know that there were so many black women in prison. And then I met uh, a young a woman, an English woman, a, a black woman from England, Nigerian and English, she was in jail at 850 Bryant Street. And, she, and I see this girl and I'm like, what happened to you? And she says, I was here looking for a, a, a grand uncle. Mm. She was down on 6th Street looking for mm. an uncle. She gets caught up in the rage, you know, fire in the hole, you know. It's like fire in the hole, all that, you know. Roll it up, roll it up, the whole thing's happening. She doesn't know. Everybody else is running down the street. The police pick her up. She is a black woman. Long legs, big booty, you know, it's like, and she's like, I'm looking for my uncle. And the cop said, oh, that's what we're calling it now. And she sat there in jail, not even knowing her rights in America, alone here. And it was another kind of uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they, and I was lining them up. Then I met a young woman named Betty who was 19 and pregnant, and she was going to general to have a baby, mm -hmm. and they, had the, they handcuffed her to yes. the bed. Yes. They like handcuffed her to the bed. 24 hours yes. after you give birth and they return you in this city back to your cell, depriving that baby of breast milk. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And That's she was saying, do. please don't handcuff me. I'm not going to run. That's right. She said, you know, I, I just had it. And she, it was a hard pregnancy. She was a baby. And it was a big baby. But, the, you know, they, they took her back to jail and the baby was taken off to CPS. That's right. Yeah. So all these things I was seeing, uh, these, uh, these and, and, I, and I knew they weren't interested in aerobics. I was like, okay, aerobics ain't gonna cut it, all right? <laughs> but I talked about me. Yeah. I dared to share my own story. Yeah. And they would say, well, why are you telling us your business? Yeah, yeah. Cause you know, African Americans, uh, we, we all caught up, don't be talking, That's don't right. tell nobody your business. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I said, because I'm, interested in how can we build a bridge out of here. Maybe it's going to be words and stories and movement that's going to take us out of this place. And one young woman said, but well, then, that, then that means you're not the popo? I said, no, I'm an artist. Yeah. And she said, well, what is that? And I thought, what is an artist in, you know, in a lockdown, in a facility? What is an artist? I mean, I am part drama therapist and all that, but I'm an artist. And I'm still attempting to answer those questions with the work. And, and when I, uh, I was taken out to, uh, out to San Bruno to work, and that's when I really brought the myth of Medea yeah. into the group. I wanted to talk to them about, um, about a classic, and I had already met this other woman, and they were very outraged that Medea would kill her children. Mm -hmm. And again, the question was, well, what are the ways that we are 
we're all like killing our children. We're not with them. You know, I started working in juvenile hall here in San Francisco mm -hmm. at 20 years old, and I myself was on probation as a young woman in, in this city. And um, when I saw your work, it was frarian. It was, there were so many things, the social, political, historical, economic frameworks that you gave women humanized the women and the mothers and the daughters, the aunties and nieces that we had loved so much that so few people when they drive down these streets, past these buildings, yes. we're, we're unrecognizable because we're, 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 we're shackled and we're locked up. The stories um, of what happens in one of the most progressive cities in the country mm. to women is unconscionable because we don't hear it unless it comes from you, right? Unless it comes from the folks who are willing to be out about having an incarcerated loved one who is, is a woman. I, I want to understand from you, in this moment, <laughs> right now, in San Francisco, and I want to give thanks and honor to Glide, because yes. for those of us who work for what scripture would say the least among us, we work for the folks who, who have nothing and it gives us glory um, that is deeper than, than anything that Facebook could provide. Yes, um, a, a woman, okay? <laughs> one young man suggested to me the other day in walking past that this is a graveyard for black people in San Francisco. Wow. I asked him how old he was, and he was 32, and he had been homeless for years, and his mother is in prison. I want to understand how you visualize, and believe me, you were a mentor, and you didn't know it, so I learned from you, so listen to me here. How you visualize freedom in a moment, especially for these women, when there is so little for them in this city. There is so little opportunity when they come out of incarceration or when they finally reach um, 30 days clean and sober and they walk out of the gate mm -hmm. outside of institutions like this who don't fail people, who constantly believe and personify redemption. What do you tell women when they are let out at 2 a.m. in the morning on 7th Street yes. with nothing, with nothing, and they're locked up three days later because they don't have the 3,000 for the first and last? Like what? How do you keep going when the conditions for the poor in the city are the worst that they've been? You know, I'm, I'm a migrant child. Come on. My mother and father were migrant workers. My grandmother, my, my great-grandmother used to make pecan brittle and she was blind. And she would go out and pick up the nuts and then she'd make the butter and the, all this is she's blind. So that's like what I carry with me. And then it becomes like, well, okay, do you want to live or do you want to die? We all have to decide that. And with women, one of the things that we find inside is our voices. If you work with me, and it's like you are no longer voiceless. How now, do you get that out of people, though? What do you, what well, it, it's like uh, I, I, I've let people cuss me out. I've let people, everything short of like, don't put your hands on me because it's going to be trouble. But if you got to cuss somebody out, cuss me out, okay? And it doesn't last for long. Right. And I want to know what, I, I, I think that so many of us who are disenfranchised, nobody wants to know. Nobody wants to, to know what that, what that dull light is behind your eyes or that rage in your smile. Nobody wants to know except for someone who looks yes. like you. Yeah. And then, and then that's getting, that's getting scarce and, and not, so, not so sacred and sane. So as an artist, I, I insist on room for them to tell their stories. But I tell everybody, we're not free. Mm. We're not free. Let's be clear. None of us. Let's be clear. Mm -hmm. They're about to make, change up your, your ID to travel in certain states in this country. Mm. And then uh, black and brown folks, we're not free. We can move like we are. You can jump up and down and scream, but we are not free. 
But at the same time, we've been doing it for a long time. The black body has had to slide in and out of so many places with a grin and a smile and a clip in the walk. And I tell them, they said, what do you mean, Ms. Jones? I said, just think about it. Okay, you can get out of jail, you gotta go. I met a woman, what you're describing, I met a woman, a, a, um, a trans, transvestite who got out of jail. She was a junkie, in and out. She would go sleep in a, uh, um, a, a service station on Guerrero Street. She'd sleep in the bathroom. This was where she would go and sleep until she could get it together. And I don't know how she, because in a three or four months, I'd see her back inside. Yeah. And uh, Mike Hennessy, who used to run the jails in San Francisco, allowed me to explore many avenues as a way to offer people some assistance. I don't know what they're doing now. But I would say to, uh, and the social worker, Sean Reynolds, who yes. uh, worked with me and taught me a lot about what women need. Women's lack of self-esteem will lead you out there and then back in, because it's like you don't have any grip on yourself, you know. And I think what we teach, uh, what we do with the Medea Project is that all of that is a part of the art. What are you hanging it all on? Well, you know? well so I want to I wanna ask this question. So we're talking about women who have, first of all, the women in the show tonight were so incredible. Yeah. Because they gave it all to us. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they gave it all to us. Who has, who has, the power and integrity and grace to stand in front of people you've never mm. met and put out all of you, yeah. right? That's what they did tonight. They were gifts, right? Like, they, like gifts, they gave us gifts. So I think when, when, you, when you have an HIV diagnosis, when you lose your babies, when you are in and out of treatment, when the people who gave you life say never, ever, again. ever come to my space of living again, you are gone, you are an adult orphan. Like, how do you walk <laughs> into that space and say, you know what, we are going to study and write about Medea. Yeah. <laughs> I want to understand how, as an artist, you m not just build this trust with the mm. women and create art, but you bring in what can typically be thought of um, as, as a, a genre that wouldn't be enticing to women who have lost so much. Mm. Well, And it's unfamiliar. My mother used to say, you know, uh, um, you're gonna walk in the light, so you better walk right, you know? And I come into the jails and I know what I look like. I'm 67 years old. And gorgeous. You know? And I'm gorgeous. fabulous, I'm fine, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I share that with them. Yes, yeah. That's it, 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 the minute we meet, it's like about, you're fabulous, you're beautiful, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, you got, yeah. and with women, it's about, we have a right to a life. That's right. White, red, black, blue women. We have a right to a life. Yes. And a lot of women don't realize this. The culture doesn't set us up to believe this. And even when, you, when you're well educated and you got all that going on for yourself, he comes along, it's all out the window because daddy's home. And I know that's worth nothing if I'm not married and if I don't have a, a good man to keep me in check even. And the man's looking at you like, well, you know, that's a lot to put on me. You know, it's like, I have worked with men. And they'll say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, but you gotta know that that's what's going on for women. So, we, so when I walk into the jails, I bring, I bring it. I bring this and I said, we're gonna have fun. You know, we're gonna have a good time. And they don't get lots of good times. Is that not right? We have fun. When we're working, we, I tell everybody, look, we have fun, we're gonna have fun. And they're like, this woman is out of her fucking mind. And, and then we do, we have a good time standing on our hands, cartwheels, you know, talking to talk, walking to walk. All the, 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 when I first started at 850 Bryant Street, the lesbians were like, you know, I don't know what the hell she's doing, but she's fine as hell and we ought to go just sit and watch. <laughs> <laughs> and they would love that. And I would say, oh, no, no, girl, you got to get up and tell your story, too. So it's lesson one, be cute. Right? <laughs> <laughs> be fabulous, Sid. Be fabulous. fabulous. Be 
and you know, and I was listening to a, La a Latin, a Latin America, the, the show on KLW today, and there was this comic, uh, I think her name is Christina, she was saying how it doesn't matter what I wear, yeah. she says, I can be dressed in my best clothes and somebody will still mistake me for the help. That's right. You know, and Intazaki Change say we dress up when we go out. For a lot of reasons, you know? Not to mention, we, I, I've worked in Africa, and Africans are the first artists. It's everything from the hat, to the makeup, to the clothes. And I bring that to distraught people, to disgruntled people, mm -hmm. people that look like me, but all people. Because one of the things I've loved about, um, I met uh, uh, Angie when many, 17 years ago at 8.50, and, uh, and Angie said, uh, I had the question, I said, well, if there was a pill that you could take that would make you black. And she said, well, if it was just for a little while. She said, and I said, well, why? She said, because the world is hard on it black people. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And that was, just, that was just a truth right off the top, you know, of understanding that. And at the same time, we can't let that, we can't let that tie us down. That's right, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So, so introducing, the, again, the, the myth into your work, uh -huh. could, I'll just say it, <laughs> which is like, could be thought of as white, white work. You brought it into what we saw tonight, but it's been uh, the, the you've created an opportunity for women to tell their stories mm -hmm. through um, the symbolism of Mythology. Yes. And I'm just interested, like, how that went over initially. <laughs> like, how do you, how do you, how do you bring, um, you're a sophisticated mm -hmm. curator, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, can you talk just a little bit about that, of bringing very sophisticated works, again, inside of places that are designed to take your soul away? Well, keep in mind that I'm a migrant worker's daughter. I was born in Florida and raised in upstate New York. I come from a family of 12 children, and we lived in a farmhouse way upstate in the country, 60 miles from Rochester, New York, and my dad would, people would give my father books, boxes of books. Okay. So one of the first books I ever had was, uh, was Greek myth, Greek yes. mythology. Yes, yes. And it was a beautiful uh, book with wonderful woodcut prints. I remember looking at the, the, the drawings of Persephone and Demeter, mm -hmm. uh, Hercules, Pandora, mm -hmm. and it was like these were the books that we read to each other, you know, uh, Aesop's Fables. So when I went into the jails, what I understood was about telling a story, you know, and, and the women, what we're describing too is that they, somewhere along the line, they're bereft. You know, they, they school ends soon, and then just, I would tell stories to them. I would tell stories to them. The Ugly Duckling, I always bring the Ugly Duckling back because that was one of the ones that we all knew. And they would read their different versions of it and I'd say, okay, now I want you to hang your life story on the Ugly Duckling, for an example, which is very simple. You're gonna put yourself at the center of it. And that's what I did with mythology of all kinds. Yeah. So, you know, the whole idea of a uh, 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 Pandora and the, the troubles of the world, the evils of the world, and getting women to personify the evils of the world. And at the same time, because we're acting, because we're, we're artists, because we're in a theater, it's safe. They're, we're in a theatrical mode. Yes. They're yes. safe. Yeah. And so I didn't even think so much about how it was like high, high literature, so much as that in America was one of the first things that I read when I was very young. It was just as my father would give us these boxes of books, and it was like, that would be the books. Those would, so they came to mind immediately that this is what I could, and the story of Hercules and Atlas and all that, those are wonderful, crazy stories. And then, then as, we, as the group grew older, it was African mythology, Ben Old Priest, The Famished Road, you know, so bringing in the idea that uh, um, um, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, we worked with that book one year, but it's also literacy. It's like getting people back to the word. So, so I don't bring myself up here so much as I, I just kind of settle down and we're all on this level. And it's like, and I just, uh, I, I tell people, I say, if you can't read, mm. say so. Come on. But if you, you're gonna pretend and front it off like, you don't, I, I don't like to read. And I say, well, if you don't, do you not like to read or you can't read? 
And because my Medea crew, they're there to help. They're there to like, they're there as a team to move in and help somebody read better, write better. And, and we're, not we're not there to judge them. And I always say to people, I'm not, I don't go into jail and say you shouldn't be a hoe. If you've been a hoe, you've been a hoe. Take care of yourself. I hope you made some money. That's right. You know, this is my place to tell you, but I want you to be the baddest ass hoe out there, that's so we're right. going to work it out. That's right. You know, we're going to work it out, and hey, that's for real, you know? So, so I guess I hope that speaks to I feel like space. she's really my mother. <laughs> I've said the same thing to sisters out there. If giving it away for free, uh -huh. it, it's not working for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, people, I would get women would feel like they could say to me that, well, I'm a prostitute, okay? You know, you, you, but you can't, uh, you can't uh, sell, uh, you know, uh, you can't sell um, chicken if it looks like mush, you know? You can't sell that, you know? And so we would work out. We would do a lot of, we did a lot of physical working out in the jails. That's one of the first things to do is save my life, the gym, That's you know? Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, so one of the things, if you follow Rodessa's work, and I know that it's late, and so we're going to wrap up, but one of the things I will say, and why I actually probe this questioning, you cannot do revolutionary work with the people unless you are clear on who you are and yes. how you face the world. You. And there is no pretending and no performance in that. And so many of us, many of, of, of the folks who have learned from you in this work, you have always showed up deeply, authentically, and brilliantly. Um, and spirit has guided you. So yes. thank you for sharing the story of, of your, your, your parents and being a migrant Always. worker and reading as a child Always. and coming in your full self and going into locked cages and telling women, I need you to believe how beautiful you are. Yes. I need for you to understand the story that you have lived is the story of Pandora, is the story yes. of Medea. It is the you story. You are mythical creatures. You yes, are mythical, we're all mythical creatures. creatures, and mythical creatures fall and they come yes. back up, and these women soar. If we could <laughs> potentially, if we could potentially invest in Harriet, what's your dream? This is my final question for. <laughs> The Medea Project, because you are a long distance runner. There's a lot of sprinters, and we've seen them come into this work real quick, real quick. Mm -hmm. But after maybe three funerals and 27 serial conversions, 19,000 relapses. Yes, yes. It's too hard. People change their cell phone numbers. <laughs> Leaders change their cell phone numbers. I said, like, why do you change your number? Mm. The same number as you have, I've heard, for mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Yeah. Grandbabies are now calling you. Yes. What can we hope for and support and love on you so that, what, that you can create in the next 10 years? What does this look like, what we just saw in 10 years? What, what's next? In 10 years, I would love to be in a position where there are, there are my, my crew here, they're all over the country and all over the world doing it too. You know, I can go in and see what they're doing, you know, we're, we're, we're making that happen. I have a company in Africa, South Africa right yeah, now, in the Naturina prisons. Mm -hmm. And I would like to be able to bring them here so they can work with this group and then they exchange, you know, the... Uh, because working in South Africa, they were so kind to me, and they, 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 they reaffirmed life for me, you know, as an artist. Uh, I went into those prisons, I said, look, we're gonna make a show, and then we're gonna take it into a theater outside of prison, and, and the, the, the authorities said, okay, great, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. It was no like, well, what you up to, and all this kind of stuff, and if so, it's time for this work. And it also, it's given me a lot. You know, I've gotten a lot out of being in, inside doing this work with women. I've gotten a lot too. It's made my life matter in a deeper way, you know. And uh, it's just service. And they're my daughters. My, my granddaughter's 25, you know. And uh, when I first worked at the, um, the uh, 850, one of my daughter's best friends, a girl who had grown up in my house, second to seventh grade, I'm walking through the corridor in the jails and she's like, Miss Jones, Miss Jones, Miss Jones. And it's like, Regina. And I'm like, 
my God, we wonder what had happened to you. Yeah. And there she was. That's right. And but she has not been back. That's right. When at the time that I was with her, I was saying, now you know, I'm, right. I, you know, I'm gonna get with you. That's right. And she has not been back to jail. You know, so it gave me purpose and it gave me heart and it gave me weight. Uh, there's a gravitas about my own life that I only could have found working with incarcerated women and moving through those prisons. And that's, that's Harriet. That's the Harriet Tudman. That's, that's the work we got to do. You have to be of service. Each one does teach one something, you know. And I just kind of fell into this wonderful, wild space of being an artist in jails. And it's a uh, it's, it's males, it's sometimes you're just like, oh my God, you know, and I don't, uh, but I do a lot of prisons around the world now. I've been in Italy, I've been, you know, I've been in uh, uh, East and West Africa in the prisons. So it's like I've gotten to like see, see uh, that this is, a com this is a community and even the artists that hang in there, we are a community of artists, yeah. So these things have all fed me and they keep me, they keep me strong, yeah. All that we do in our work, we must model these reflections on the folks who bring light into dark spaces. It is hard work. What Ms. Jones won't tell you, because I know people you know, is your real goal was to end mass incarceration. Yes, that would be true. <laughs> that would be true. <laughs> That would be true. <laughs> so, and, but your astute political nature makes it clear that while our women are still there, it is not appropriate to only be behind the bullhorn. We must sit with them, lay with them, love on them, and feed them, and pray with them, and cry with them. And remind them that they're still a part of the circle of life, of the, of the family, That's you know? Right. They still are. Because like, like uh, I think uh, one of Angie's pieces, my family doesn't speak to me anymore. Mm. You know, so, but then we have to make them realize that there's a larger family waiting out there. And I mean, it's not easy. I yes. mean, it's not easy to have people in and out of jail and all this kind of stuff. So artists such as myself, when I'm inside, I confront them about that. What that's did right. you do? That's right. What did you do that your grandmother doesn't want? Your that's grandma, right. I'm a grandmother. That's, your that's grandmother right. doesn't want you around? Absolutely. Let's talk about what you did. That's right. You know? Yeah. That's and, right. Uh, that's right. Yeah, so. And I believe that your accountability, that face-to-face -face restorative justice, yes. first of all, don't cost nothing. Yeah. It don't cost $70,000 a year. Yeah, that conversation exactly. that you're having exactly. with that woman to hold her accountable for what she took, mm -hmm. for who she hurt. Yes. And we argue that concrete cells don't do that, that connection does that. I want to thank everyone for gathering around us. Glide will close, but I want to deeply for you to join me in standing and giving thanks and homage to this leader. Woo! Idris, where are you? Where's Idris? Rodessa Jones and Latifa Simon, everyone. If you if you could stay one second, have a have a quick seat. Yeah, we're gonna love on you for a, for a second. Yeah. We 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 just we just want to thank you really for your words and your wisdom. You know, this is a community that believes that we have to teach people and empower people to tell their own stories because we have too much proof that this world will get you wrong, leave you out, marginalize you, or just lie on you yes. all together. And if you tell your own story and you learn how, then you get to decide how it's gonna end. And if you're gonna be a comic figure or a dramatic figure or a hero in your own story, but you gotta learn how to tell your own story. So yes. thank you for reminding us of that. Thank you all for coming, folks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so truth and justice. <sighs> um, gotta remember Malcolm. 
And gotta re- you've got to remember the beauty of, uh, of a Harriet Tubman. You've got to remember Muhammad Ali. You've got to remember, oh, oh my gosh, you see, it's, it's so many people are flying across my consciousness. You take it. What do you think? Um, Shirley Chisholm, yes. uh, Ella Baker, yes. the mothers of slain young men and young women who just give. Yes. Sandra Bland. Come on. Yes. Myth and truth. We can all fly. Hmm. <laughs> there is a way to fly. Uh, it's a myth that, uh, that's, that there, are, there are some that are better than others. It's just about finding your soul, defining your soul space. You know, there's, there's a myth around uh, who should have and who should not. We can all get. I tell my daughter who's four, um, and we lost her dad, my husband, to cancer a year and a half ago, and I can't believe it's been a year. She makes up things every single day. My daddy wrote this song for me. Mm. My daddy liked, you know, I'll just make spaghetti. My daddy loves spaghetti. And I said, myth is, or or I said, lies are really creation. Mm. Myth is really creation. And we, it is recreation of what actually has happened. and as long as those myths don't hurt anyone, I think we have to continue to create, and little kids should be able to have imaginations, including the ones that live right across the street. My, my granddaughter, at the age of six, her father, she lost it too. Yes. And I remember she would get really sad, and uh, I'd say, well, did you pray for daddy? She, she, she'd miss him, she, and she'd want to see him, and she'd say, well, yeah, grandma, but does my daddy pray for me? Yes. And, uh, and, and so I, 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 that's a part of that mythology. It's like the, yeah, I, I, I tell you, yeah, he's Absolutely. watching over us. He's praying for you right now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So thank you. Thank you thank both you, for playing Margie. with us. Hello, and thank you for marvelous delight and inspiration. I have a question that a lot of people in this audience would want to ask you. What do you think about the upcoming plans about new jail for San Francisco. About the new jail construction the new jail. and tremendous amount of funding for it. It is a pity that more of us. Are, I used to be out in the streets all the time when I was a young woman. I mean, I was throwing Molotov cocktails, going to jail, doing the whole thing. And I tell my youth, my students, I'm, I'm too old now. I'm too old and tired. And our children get very distracted by those little screens. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I find so many children have no idea about the political process if they're not, if they, and also the justice and stuff that's going down. So it's a pity. Um, I think that we have to continually, as, as Latifah is talking about her baby, the four-year-old, I'm sure the, the child hears all these other things in the house. We have to keep our children open to what's happening. It's about the future, you know. Um, it's going to take a lot of legislation to, to stop building jails. And it, that takes a lot of stamina and uh, vision and vigilance. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think we have to be teaching that as much as we can. But it's a pity. It's a pity there's a new jail. You know, um, yeah. But, but I agree. No new jail. Yeah, um, we don't need a new no jail. No new jail. And when we walk inside the corridors, the underground mo- uh, spaces of San Francisco, as, as you do right here on the street, then you see just the suffering of people who just have absolutely nothing to even guard themselves mm-hmm. from rain. Mm. Um, it, it is shocking. It is shocking that we're talking about creating infrastructure to hold poor people on timeout. What I really would be interested in people doing um, who are in power of t- figuring out how we create real solutions yes. that keep people with their families. And they're not, they're, they're not mythical. I'm talking about bail reform. A very large percentage mm. of the folks in our current jails are in there because they cannot post bail. When the judge actually gives uh, y- you bail, the judge is saying, if you have money, you can go out and be with your family. Uh, so let's just be clear. There are ways in which good policy can happen. The, one of the things I think Ms. Jones is, is, what is she saying is, we actually 
have to figure out how we are everywhere and making decisions in every space, in every place. Why I decided after all these years of throwing down mm. and being in the streets that I have to run for office is That's because right. um, the way in which we, we, I'm sick of begging people to make decisions that affect my family. Mm -hmm. I refuse to just please. I got three minutes. No, I don't want three minutes. I want it to be my job, right? To make decisions that actually have real impact. But we cannot create strong movement without culture. And tonight, yes. tonight is really, um, it provides us another glimpse in all successful movements for social justice. Culture was at the center and culture is the biggest weapon that we have. Yes, I agree, I agree, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a favorite quote and part of it speaks to the importance of not just being strong but feeling strong and I think it's really inspiring as a younger woman to witness people, or women that aren't just out in the world being strong, but you can read that they truly feel strong on the inside as well. And I'm wondering if you can recall an early or maybe ex exceptional time that you recognized that you weren't just doing something strong, but they could feel it inside of you that you were also feeling strong, and what it took um, to summon that and what you might have been feeling in that moment. Mm. Wow. When I first was at uh, 850, and uh, there, were, there were lovers, women in my group, we get to talking about behavior amongst lesbians, behavior, how women treat each other, and a couple of times, uh, the girls would get to fighting with each other. And I'd have to, I'd just go in there and body slam people. You know, I mean, I was so upset. What One, you, you do care for each other. What is this display of violence and this name calling and bitch this and bitch that? And the deputies would be like, oh, Jones has got it covered. You know, they would be up there going, you all right, Miss Jones? And I'd say, yeah, but I'm sick of these people. That I'd leave early sometimes. And it was like this, and other women were like, damn. You know, and I did, and, and I was, it was moved more because I was sad that all the good fun that we just had, and then somebody maybe says something, or one girl is more nervous about coming out, about her relationship with another woman, and then they get into a physical fight. And, it's, and, and what I could do was break it up. And I remember just feeling older than them. I'm like, damn, I'm nearly 45 years old and I'm up here breaking up fights, but I got this, you know? And they would be like, and the other women standing around, I'd say, no, don't do this in my class. And don't get it twisted. You don't get to do this in my class. And it would surprise me, because then I'd go out, I'd go out and I'd go, damn, I was out of my mind to go off, so they could have they could have beat me up, but they didn't, you know. So I guess if that speaks to it, it was like it was refreshing to know I could handle it. And I was fighting for them for something that they thought was undercover and a little moldy and a little grimy. And I was like, no, 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 you care about her. Why are you gonna treat her like this now? And why are you gonna why are you gonna be involved in something where you both are drawing blood? Two women? You know, and, and they were just like, no, Miss, De Miss Jones is off the chain. But it was like, you know, and I could be off the chain, and I was fine. The deputies would say, you all right? I'd say, yeah, I'm cool. And later they'd say, Jones has got it. And I'd be like, okay. But I guess that's, that happened to me too. Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, my rawness. I have eight brothers, so I learned to roll and wrestle with men a long time ago. So women, like, you, you got to be a bad one. You come... You know, because I go, I'm going to come for you. You know, I don't do it as much as I'm old now, but, you know. I, I think it's important to, um, to be able to sit in a, in a number of spaces, but at the end of the day, um, be able to walk down any street in the city yes. and be fearless. And, make, and if you fall, nine people will catch you. I think to answer your question, <laughs> I, um, I realized that... Creator had given me something mm. very special. It was one day, you know, I was an executive director at a very early age. I ran the Center for Young Women's Development, and we had created literally hundreds of jobs for girls who were coming out of detention to be organizers and advocates. And some you would see after their time, and some you wouldn't. And I was walking down after a meeting on 16th Street, and I saw a young woman that I had worked with in four, four years, and she had done well. 
and she just disappeared. And I hadn't seen her for a couple of years. And she saw me. I was a little bit blinder than her. She saw me first. And she covered her face. And I said, is that you? And then I said her name. She had come out of a hotel. She was visibly pregnant. Tons of like eyeliner and she hadn't washed her face for days. Mm. She had on a parka and her man mm. was right in back of her. And I was like, you pregnant? And you know, those of us who've done the work, you know exactly what was happening in that moment. Yeah. But he stepped back and he said, ma'am, I'll let you talk to her for a minute. And I knew this pimp. I knew him from years on doing work out here. Mm. And she said, I am so sorry, Latifa. And I said, you are exactly where you need to be in this moment. And I don't know how that came into yes. my head. It was all God, because I didn't believe that. I was like, how could you? You got a baby in you and you shooting dope up in this hotel and you 21 and like you have had every opportunity. You know, it was like, I yes. wanted to do that. But I, you, have, you have everything that you need right now in this moment and you're supposed to be in this moment. And I left her, because she said, go. I was like, you can come with me, you can stay in my house. But I left her. She's okay now. She's clean and sober. But it was in that moment when all the pedagogy that I had been fed by my mentors about self-determination and about women and choices and falling and getting back up uh, and me releasing my codependency and wanting to save my mother and my father. You know what I'm saying? Like that my work is spiritual and that I work for these women and that I almost need to take their lead sometimes yes. because no one can save anyone. Programs don't save people. Spirit saves people, period. Jobs don't save people. Yes. Jails don't save people, right? People save people. And it changed me that years later she got at me and she said, my probation officer didn't scare me as much as I was scared of seeing you oh. <laughs> and letting you down. And when I saw you, I went to Harbor Lights the next day because I never want you to see me. Mm. Don't doubt again, Latifa, because you love me. And all I have is love. I have nothing else, nothing material. And I, and, and I think about that day every single day. And we, have all, we all have those moments. But when you are, like Ms. Jones, born to do something, you can tread, tread many different trails, but you always will come back to the women who you love and who love you. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Again.